Midnight cult meetings. Daylight slayings. Highly recommended. All that and more. Cody, punch Mike. That's a lot of damage. <laughs> now watch me use flex tape to put them back together. I punched this bitch in half. <laughs> <laughs> Got a flex on these hoes. You damn right. Hit them with the flex tape. <laughs> flex tape. Flex tape. God damn it. That's each arm's name. It's flex and tape. <laughs> Jesus fuck. Because yeah, that's a lot of fucking damage. Mike's got to put himself back together with flex tape. Boy. Boy! You you got some you got some money to be spending for that. Just saying. Who buys stock in it? I want to know who the fuck like is like, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take all this money and put it in flex tape. Stop. Stop. Vander Holyfield, apparently. He needs one for that ear. Yeah. A lot of it. <laughs> Welcome. It is it is one thirty six in the fucking morning at the time of recording. Is it? It really fucking is. Oh my fucking god. It it's right. That's right. Why am I still awake? I'm delusional as fuck. Maybe it was the weed. Oh. That's a massacre of weed in my system. It is a massacre of weed in our system. A mass. Uh, yeah. 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 Bruh. Not just that. It it may have also been a very like meaty satanic massacre. Mm, ritualistic again. That's what I'm saying. Mm, tasty. Episode twenty six of the Super Media Brothers podcast. I am Midnight Agent Raw. And I am Okami. We have an awesome edition lined up for you. We announced last week that we would be premiering a brand new in show series. And here it is, the inaugural episode of the Cult Cinema Showdown. And who are facing off against each other? Why? It is the movie's 420 Massacre and... Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre. Fight! God damn it. Oh wait, that was a little too early. (laughs) So, we've got 420 Massacre directed by Dylan Reynolds, and we've got Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre directed by Gino McGahee. Yo, you homie. That's right. What up, guys? So, uh, first off, I want to say that I don't think we could have picked two better movies to kick this shit off with. I couldn't agree more. Uh, We we had a fucking blast watching both of these. Um, I had seen Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre prior to this, and uh, Cody, this was your first time seeing both of these movies. Correct. That's right. So, I guess what we're going to do is kind of explain what the whole idea behind the cult cinema showdown is we take two films that are considered cult cinema, be it, it it could be any genre, but as long as it is considered cult cinema, like underground indie, anything movie, basically. Yeah. Anything like that. And we will take them and stick them together and we will kind of have them face off against each other. Not necessarily be like, Oh, this one's better. You should like buy this one, go fuck that other film, blah, blah, blah. But just like, Take them in, review them, talk about them, discuss them, the, that whole shenanigans, you know, all that shit. Pretty much. Yeah. They're not going to fight to the death because they already did that in the movies. They were massacred. Very much. Yeah. Bloody pulps. Bloody fucking pulps. Slayish. Slayish. So. <laughs> Will you stop that? No. Fuck. Fuck you. Fuck you, eh? Fuck you. You're going to end up behind an old navy if you ain't careful. Hashtag, fuck you, knife culture. <laughs> yes, we are still on that train, so hop aboard if you that haven't already. never going to stop. That's right, fuck faces. So be prepared. Yes. Let's get this motherfucker kicked off, dude. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so first up, Dylan Reynolds' 420 Massacre. This was released on April 13th, 2018. Was it on a Friday? That's a damn good question. Because that'd be awesome. (laughs) If it was. Why didn't he release this on 420? 
God damn it. Dylan, if you're listening to this. Come on, man. You dropped the ball now. What happened, man? You dropped the gram. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> That's actually really funny because there was a scene in this movie where I was like, dude, how are you going to bring Coke to a fucking weed party? Right. You know? And Just, also, all they had was hot dogs. They could have had a lot more munchies than that. Bruh. Bruh. Bra. Exactly. You got you got five grown ass women that are gonna munch on like one hot dog a piece. Like, bro, bring some more food. And not even on a sexual level. That's right. Actual hot dog between buns. Not on a sexual level. Still. <laughs> still. I mean, food is sexual to us, but still not. Still not. No. So I guess we'll take it from the top on this one. Um, so will they? <laughs> you damn right. So I was very pleasantly surprised by this movie. Again, like I mentioned to you, it came out better than I thought it was going to do. It really did. Yeah, because like I, I purposely went in blind. You know, obviously for both these movies, I, I watched like a little bit of a trailer. I saw like a little synopsis of it, and really, like the synopsis was a fu- a, a fupa, <laughs> a fupa. <laughs> That's right. A group of five women go camping in the woods to celebrate a, fupa, a friend's a five women. To f- fupa of five. God damn it. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, they go into the woods to have a little camping, hiking, extravaganza they, on quote four twenty. They are celebrating the birthday of Jess. They are friend. That's right. But what happens is they cross the turf of an illegal marijuana grow operation. Now we forgot to mention this. This is a spoiler thing. We're going to be talking about key points of both films. So if you actually want to watch these, stop. Go do that, and then come back. In fact, if you want to stop and do that right now, like Cody just mentioned, go look in our show notes. We have links directly like to both of these films on the Amazon Prime. Yeah, yeah. So you can rent twenty, you can rent four twenty Massacre, and you can stream uh, Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre for free. Yes, on your Amazon Prime account. That too. Getting that plug in. Go. Okay, so spoilers in three, two. One. Okay, the two motherfuckers in the beginning of this son of a bitch. Cheesiest fucking potheads I've ever seen. But goddamn, it was entertaining. Very much. So they're they're kind of like, they got a map and they're walking through looking for, obviously, the, the grow site. Mm-hmm. And they find it in the most, like, oh, bro, way possible. Look at the gold mine. Dude. <laughs> and that one guy just get... Mm. Just way into it. Just wasted right off the fucking bat. But see, what threw me off at that point was the uh, low-budget Swamp Thing costume-looking dude came out of nowhere and just slashed him. You mean the shape? Yeah, the shape. The shape. What, which what, what shape are you, sir? Well, he that was a throwback to Halloween. Yeah, I know. But, you know, still. Which, <laughs> uh, the more we get into this, when uh, there were a lot, a lot of pop culture references in this movie. References, if you will. References. You're welcome. Hashtag. Hashtag pop culture references. Bam. Bitches. So, Um, yeah, go ahead, dude. (laughs) So, basically, Homeboy kills both of these. Well, no, he kills one of them, sorry. Yeah. So, the other one takes (laughs) off. The other one. The uh, uh, other one (laughs) takes off with a backpack full of weed, full of growth, and... Comes panning over to the five chicks. That drive up in a Jeep or something. Yeah, some kind of like four, four door, four wheel drive vehicle. Whatever. Something that a group of women would drive, sir. I mean, we're not stereotyping, but. We're so. not. But damn. So yeah, they chit chat, they talk, they laugh, they joke, and then they park. And they get all their shit together and they start hiking from there. Three miles up to the destination they want to go to. Now, they open the back hatch, and here comes this was probably great. our favorite car- character in the whole movie. Donna. Donna. She is literally the best female pothead character I've ever seen because I have not seen too many female pothead characters. Quite refreshing in this movie, mind you. Refreshing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> High five. <laughs> ha! Ha! But yeah, they basically open the hot box of the hatch. The hatch. The hatchbacks. And she is literally <laughs> like just bubbling energy of hemp. 
you know it, right and then just smoke just pouring out and okay i'm not shitting on this but it is kind of funny like okay the back half of that in the car you got to think if you've driver, ever ridden an suv or anything like that the back part is open to the rest of the vehicle mm-hmm. how did when the other four got out how did the smoke not like like how are they not contact high right now oh i'm just saying but still visually that was goddamn hilarious you just and just smoke billowing out the back. Ganja shop. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, they get out, they unpack and get their stuff together to go hiking three miles up the trail to their destination. And about what halfway through the hiking, yeah, they come across Ranger Rick. Ranger Rick, who they question. You can't protect him, Rick. Nope, you dick. They question each other. How is it that they have to park their vehicle two to three miles back to hike up this road when motherfucking Rick drives down the road? That's called special privileges, sir. I'm telling you, white man. <laughs> so, yeah. God damn it, Cody. <laughs> You're right, though, motherfuckers. Come on now. Come on. Everybody boy. who listens to YouTube know me, so bye now. <laughs> Anyway, but not yeah. So <laughs> this man drives up in his his Ranger vehicle, this truck, and they're like, "How in the hell we parked back there? Why am I getting hick all of a sudden?" He's a mighty Morphin Park Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> Ganja Zord, <laughs> Yogi Bear, <laughs> picketing baskets. <laughs> hey, boo boo. I don't think the ranger's going to like this, Yogi. I don't think so. Better get the fuck out of here. (laughs) I'm feeling a little worried. (sighs) Anyway. Yeah. He pulls up. He's like, what are you women doing out here by yourself? Y'all shouldn't be alone. There's danger in these woods. And they're like, oh, we'll be fine. We're good. We do this all the time. Kind of. You know. You know how girls do. So Gorals. they eventually come across homeboy with the stolen backpack of ganja who frighteningly like is hauling ass out of the woods, you know, from being chased by the shape way earlier. And he just like falls the fuck down and fucking Jess just kind of calmly walks to him and she's, you know, just like, oh, hey, hey, it's OK, blah, blah, blah. And he's just sitting there like, oh, my friend's dead. And. All the rest of them are like, he's fucking out of his mind. He's stoned. He doesn't know what the fuck he's saying. Even Donna is like, hey, this dude's like not okay. Right? <laughs> when the stoner fucking has to point out that somebody is not okay, something is wrong. Man's tripping, man. Right? Zoinks. Literally, literally, he tripped over that rock and fell the fuck down. And he's like just coddling his backpack of goods. <sighs> but yeah, this dude's, <laughs> this dude's freaked out like fuck. Yeah. And they just kind of casually ignore him. Not really ignore him, but they're like, oh, yeah, the ranger will be around, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, you know, that... The only happens. ranger in the whole fucking the forest. The only ranger. The lone ranger. The lone ranger. Yes. He's not Walker. The stoned ranger. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> not Walker. Driver, Texas ranger. Driver, Texas ranger. <laughs> Even though it was California, but still, God damn it. So when he parks his vehicle, he's the park ranger. <laughs> He's a drive ranger, a park ranger, and a walker <laughs> ranger. Because when he gets out of the vehicle, he just—he's all range. He is all range. He is—he is the human epitome of four by four driving ranger. He's a Range Rover <laughs> dog. So he drives, he walks, he roves, just just like a good park ranger should. Wherever I may rove, anyway. <laughs> that's right. So they get to their little campsite and they set up shop. Um, then there's like 90s rock music in the background too. Yeah, we kind of get to uh, we proceed to get to know the women a little better, which that's one thing I did want to point out. Um, I, I know like some people out there may not consider so like if you watch this, you may not consider this decent character development. But given given the simplicity of this film, I really enjoyed what we got from these these women. And that that was a noticeable thing that I picked up on was there was more dialogue that was given to us with each person and as a group than most movies would give across because 
most of the time you get like these little snippets of like a minute, maybe 30 second dialogue skits. And then they kind of continue on with the plot or the action or whatever is going on with these five. They have more moments, more meaningful times to give us more of that kind of attachment to each character to go, okay, well, I like this one a little bit more because she's A, B, C, D or whatever, you know? Yeah. So that was a very good thing that this film did well. So yeah, and what I what I liked was um, you have Donna. Obviously, she's the fifth wheel of the group, and you know, arguably the most fun one. Um, but she has her soul made with her. That's right, the bong. That's right. <laughs> so you got Donna and her boyfriend, the bong, and then you've got, and I thought this was kind of an interesting dynamic. You had the other four women. Uh, obviously two of them were kind of like already, you know, flirtatious with each other a little bit, but then you had Aubrey and Jess who Aubrey had, you know, a thing for, it was later revealed. She had a thing for her since, you know, before she knew she was into women, all this other shit. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got Rachel and Michelle who were, you know, obviously kind of into each other, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, they didn't, but the, the cool thing about it was they didn't sell this um they didn't sell this film on that because it's so easy t- for a trope for a horror film to fall into and I, no granted this was some comedy too but it's so easy for a horror trope to fall into that category of like tits ass like sex women on women and you know all this other shit which before we go any further that impressed me the most this movie did not have a sl- uh, like a a bit of nudity in it Mm-mm. not even like a intense moment well they kind of they did have an intense moment but it wasn't anything that was like it was tasteful it was tasteful yeah it kind of got you the idea behind it but it didn't get too far into it yeah but what i liked about it was it was like two different spectrums you had like the dynamic set up with what's their names uh you have like because you had like jess and aubrey had their kind of set up and then you had like rachel and michelle and right yeah rachel and michelle you know they they go off into the woods and what i liked was um, Rachel's character had that kind of girl next doory mm-hmm. kind of look, and then Michelle had that kind of, um, you were saying kind of more like a free spirit kind of looking, you know what I mean? Kind of like a um hippie, basically in a, l- a way, a little bit, mostly. But yeah, they were more of the dynamic set of because they had more of like the connection, more of the um dialogue that was more engaging. Yeah, not just with each other, but with how the audience would grasp with them as well. Because whenever they would talk to each other, it felt like something, well, people like me and you or anybody that's like us would actually associate with. It felt natural dialogue. Right. And then Jess and Aubrey was more of that static, more of that kind of just tension, more, you know, just there's... there's ten- there was uncertainty. Right. There was uncertainty. There was some kind of like hesitation. So you picked up on both ends. I mean, granted, if you can do that, you can pick up on that before anything happens. So we get both sides of it, and then we continue to... Well, first of all, we forget about the first actual, like, gruesome kill. And I was so saddened by this. Look, okay, I have not fallen in love with a character on screen, like, this quickly in a long time. But, dude, as soon... And I'm not even, like, joking. As soon as Donna rolled out of the back of that fucking truck, I was like, oh, my God. I love this woman. Like mm-hmm. she's she's fucking awesome. She's goofy. She's you know funny. So obviously, like we spoke about the 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 two you know duos of females, they split off, and then Donna stays behind with the bong on the picnic or bong uh, blanket because everybody's done taking a hit off this except for Jess who does not smoke. So she's sitting there. She thinks she hears something, <laughs> but wait, there's, there's more. more. She goes to take a hit of this bong. And then homeboy Shape basically shoves her face onto the bong. Like mouth, you know? Yeah, and she's resisting as best as she can and literally shoves her head impaling-wise on the bong. Yeah, and then the top of the bong, you can see just push brain matter out of the back of her fucking skull. And then he goes to take a hit from the bong after. Fatality. Like, holy shit. I think that's probably the most gruesome death because of just the concept behind it. Not so much the the death itself, but what happens after. Like, he literally is that sick 
to take a hit from a dead woman, you know, brain matter and shit. He ripped her skull and then ripped that bong. Literally. <laughs> like, straight up. Jeez. Rip. So, I, dude, and that was the funny part about, uh, it wasn't funny, but like, me and you, like, because we literally just watched these a while ago. So, sitting there, when that happened, Cody and I, like, at this same fucking time, we're like, holy fucking shit! Quite a shocker. Yeah, I mean, I, you have to know, like, people are going to die in these movies, you know, but fuck. Why her first? Was she, was she the token character of the movie? The token minority. That's right. Like, literally, token. Dude. D- bruh. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <sighs> Morpheus, I know Kung Fu. He's starting to believe. I know Bong Fu. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So that happens. Yeah, that happens. Nobody finds her yet. So we cut over to uh, we cut over to Rachel and Michelle who are getting more intimate with each other. Rachel hears something, goes checks it out. Nothing there. Nothing there. Comes back, throws the fucking wine bottle that they brought with them on the ground. You fucking littered a state forest. Literally. You literally littered. Bitch. You motherfucker. How can you hate nature? Let me just say, that's the other thing that I noticed. Um, there's a couple of tropes that I did notice. Like, one you noticed and one I noticed. Uh, everybody that smoked got fucking killed. Mm-hmm. And then when the when uh, they were about to have sex or whatever... You were like, wait, they didn't smoke just yet. And I was like, no, they're about to have sex because that's a fucking trope. That's a horror movie trope. So here comes the shape with that bottle that he finds. He breaks it against a tree and then they're just like, I thought I heard something. And Don't you know, fuck with me. Yeah, right, right. And, and Michelle's on the ground like, no, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> this was one of the more like fucked up kills. He t- he has the broken end of this bottle with the, um, the, the spout end. Hmm. And the ass end of it's broken. He fucking shoves it into Rachel's face. Around the eye. Yeah, and then proceeds to tilt her forward. And as the blood is, like, coming out, it's coming out of the end of the bottle. And he's just pouring blood all over Michelle. And she's just tripping shit. Like, freak the fuck out. So, pan over to Jess and Aubrey after they have their little... Tense moment, basically, of Aubrey admitting how she feels about Jess. And Jess not reciprocating. I mean, she gave off, like, mixed dialogue, which I was kind of confused for a second. It's like, okay, first of all, you said you were surprised by it, and it's okay, but now you're telling her, no, I'm not into that. It's like, you kind of just, like, lowballed her a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I, you know, and that's what I was getting at with the character development. I was I was sitting there like, oh, my God, let it happen. Like, I was, I was hoping for it. I was like, oh, my God, please let it happen. Please let it happen. And then it didn't, and I was like... Yeah, because that God was like it. that was your second favorite character was Aubrey, because you just felt that morning like okay, she's really feeling emotions for her. Yeah. So anyway, we get to them too. They're walking back to the camp, and they finally see Donna just you know fucking dead, literally fucked up. And here comes Michelle, just freaking the fuck out. And then here comes Mister Shape, right? But dude, and th- okay. This is at the point of the movie where, which we've already figured this out. Cody and I have already deduced this by now. But this is the part of the movie when you find out that Jamie Bernadette, the the female that plays Jess, they're they're all wonderful actresses. Like I, they 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 couldn't have cast this any better, in my mm-hmm. opinion. But like this is the moment where you see Jamie Bernadette just really like fucking just come right in. She grabs she grabs Aubrey's mouth and she's like basically like she don't do that because she starts fucking yelling. Mm-hmm. And she gives, like, the best facial expressions. Yeah, and that was something you noticed at first. And I was like, oh, let me let me look into this more, and I'll actually be the yeah. judge of that. But we get to, let's see, who died first? Was it? Uh, Donna died first. No, 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 no. It was, at this point, it was Michelle died first. She okay, died, so, she died uh, yeah. from what? What was it? Was it the throat? No, Michelle. Okay, no, Donna, Donna was impaled with the bong, and then Michelle was stabbed with the ass into that, that champagne bottle. So after that, Rachel. Yes. Okay. Rachel so, gets fucking killed right there. Yeah, she gets slit, right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, that happens. They run off, and then here comes Dick with the fucking crossbow, 
shoots Aubrey in the back, like literally in the back of the cat or the thigh muscle. Fuck you! Right above her knee, and she goes down on the ground. Ranger Rick, aka Daryl Dixon. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. See, because at this point, it's just the two of them. So Aubrey looks over, and she's like, "I will catch up with you." Fucking run! So she's like, "Hey, asshole!" And she fucking takes a run, and that's when she gets nailed yeah, with the fucking arrow. Mm-hmm. So naturally, Jess is freaked out, and she's like, "Oh fuck!" So the shape shows up, <laughs> or <laughs> in in tip top shape, I might add. So. They basically take them, tie them up, and, you know, Ranger Rick is explaining to them they have um, just stumbled upon their whole operation, and they can no longer allow them to live because they've seen too much. And also, Rick is the father of the ship. That's right. Because Homeboy is a ex-Marine, or he's an ex-some kind of armed forces. Ex-military, and he's gone nuts. Well, yeah, he basically got fucked up in the head, and now he doesn't know better, so now he literally just kills people in the forest. Yep. And so. l- let's rewind a little bit. So earlier when uh, Buddy, the guy that came out from the forest screaming, um, he gives uh, Donna his bag of weed that he stole from the beginning of the movie. So mm-hmm. now Aubrey and Jess have it. So Rick sees this, and he's like, oh, you're stealing you know, my shit, blah, blah, blah. This is when... Dude, and this is this is where it fucked me up. Because you knew Aubrey was about to bite it. I mean, he takes that big-ass fucking field knife out, and she just looks over at Jess and is like, I love you, and she's like, I love you too, and just fuck it. Dude, she gets her head Serates. sawed right the fuck off. And this is the best part of the film for me, is when Jess loses her shit. Because you see it in her face. Like, she shifts from this, like, reclusive, like very quiet kind of type girl to this like I'm gonna fuck your shit up it's the quiet ones you gotta watch out for telling you so she's literally telling Rick oh no you're gonna die before I will and they're like he's like laughing his ass off and thinking it's funny while he's hitting the so she's unraveling her ties He she goes to flip what's his name buddy no 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 the shape I'm sorry I thought his name was buddy for some reason nope so he gets flipped over, and they have a little tussle and whatnot. He, what does he do? Recall, recall. I can't think off the top of my head. What, Rick or the shape? Rick. Oh, Rick is trying to grab the, um, I think he's trying to go for the crossbow or something at some point. Yeah, because I think Jess blocked the knife or something. Or he, no, he not, she knocked him out. I remember that. And then she got the knife and started stabbing the shape in the back. Yeah, she stabbed the fuck out of him. Yeah, which surprisingly didn't put him down. Yeah, and she takes off running into the woods. Mm-hmm. And he goes in hot pursuit, Rick does. And he, I think, this is the point where he, uh, she almost goes down a cliffside, turns around, hides a knife in her back, and he shows up, and he's just like, you know what? And I absolutely love this part. Dude, look, I think either... Yeah, okay. <laughs> he shows up and he's all like, you know, this is going to go one of two ways. You can jump off or whatever, you know, or you can be a fucking pussy and have me push you off or whatever. And he's just taking his time with her talking about how, like, you know, you're going to die all this other shit. So he grabs her up by the throat and picks her up and he's just talking shit to her. And uh, he's all like, you know, are you ready to die? And she just kind of is scared. And then she just changes her face like that. And she's like, are you? And fucking just stabs him right in the fucking, fucking neck, neck with that, that goddamn field knife. Mm-hmm. Just Hard. Spewing blood out of every fucking orifice you can think of in the neck. Oh, and that motherfucker just goes down for the count. But wait, there's, there's more. more. Here comes the shape, you fucker. So she grabs the crossbow and starts pinning him in the chest. Like, and, two or three times. And then, again, in the fucking head, like, through the eyeball. Yeah, that was, like, the luck shot, because he went for her, lost the crossbow, and then she kind of got out of the way, dove for it, and did, like, this real quick shot straight to the fucking eye. Then, then, he gets on top of her, starts to strangle her. You see the freaking bolt sticking out of his eye, and then all of a sudden he just starts bleeding through the mouth. But dude, there was a hot fucking second where me and you were just sitting there like, oh, they they cannot fucking kill her now. Mm-mm. They cannot fucking do this. <sighs> but he topples. Yep. All from that shot. Like that was my biggest point. It's like, bitch got stabbed like 
three or four times in the back for one. So he should have been bleeding out by that point too. He got shot in the gut. He got shot in the t chest twice. And then he got shot in the right eye. Or the left eye, sorry. So how is he still walking around? Maybe Ex he, explain that. Maybe he's on PCP. Maybe. Just just throwing that out there. But like I said, the progression with Jess from when he's starting to kill everybody to now was like a drastic change, and it was just so perfect because the f the acting capability of her was just so well done. Absolutely agreed. And I think the coolest part about this whole thing, uh, obviously she comes out on top as the victor. She stands up, turns around, walks over to the edge of that cliff, sits the fuck down. The the um, Ranger the Rick has dropped his fucking blunt or his his joint on the ground. Doobie. Jess, who does not smoke, has not smoked, sits there, picks it up, and just starts toking on it as the credits roll. Which the fucking credits in this movie were awesome as shit. A they looked fucking mm, plus. They were unique, and they ha they had the, 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 their own little graphics, and they're like, you know, the way that they were worded, it's like, oh, the cast of this, or like the um, the players of this film, like Jamie Bernadette was Jess, Vanessa Parker was Aubrey, Stacey Danger was Donna, so, you know, uh, so on and so forth. It felt like a mix of like comic book with like Grindhouse kind of feel to it. And I loved that. And this movie was a good mixture of all of that. Like, it had... Um, Make no mistake about it. This isn't a straight up horror movie, y'all. This this is like a comedy as well. Like, and it was very well done. Mm -hmm. Um, I fucking love this movie. Oh, and another thing. Um, as the credits were rolling, I noticed like the the music of the movie was done by a band called Sleeping Wolf. Donna was wearing a fucking Sleeping Wolf T shirt like through her shots in the movie, which I never pointed out myself until he said that. So yeah, I thought that was really fucking cool. Also. <laughs> Much like Samurai Cop, this movie took place entirely during the day. Yeah, all within, what, like a four-hour, basically like a four-hour time span, because it was like three o'clock when they arrived, and it was like close to like eight almost. Yeah. And I like, and, and again, this goes this goes with um, the simplicity of this film. The plot was not so fucking deep that you had to look for shit. Like, it was really simple. You had a great cast. You had a really good script. You had good writing. You had good direction. You had good editing. Um, you had reefer references. Yes, you did. That Back to the Future reference. <laughs> Where we're going, we'll need no roads. And then the Friday the 13th, of the ch -ch -ch when mm. they're walking in the fucking woods, and she's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> but really, though... Um, the simplicity of this worked out really well. The setting where it was just the one location that everything about this movie played to its strengths. Um, I mean, of course, like no movies without its flaws, but I mean, because if any, if you're out there looking for like major gore factor, like a plenty, there's not a lot of it, but the kills you do get are fucking really good. Like the one dude that got his entrails sliced out and he tried to put them back in. So trauma esque. It was just so like <laughs> I know dude, I saw you over there on the couch. You were just like oh oh god. And I was like And I'm not normally squeamish when it comes to that, but that was just so strangely squeamish to me. Reminds me of Akira whenever fucking Tetswell falls down, he's trying to pick his shit back up and put it in. Pretty much. So now the only like minor faults that I will point out was during the scene where all five of the girls were together and the music was playing, the music volume was like way too fucking loud. For me. I did notice that too. And it aggravate it aggravates me whenever the sound quality is just kinda off to the point where it either distracts me from the music or distracts me from the scenario of the plot. So that was kind of an agitating thing for me, like I said. Um Like I said, the, I wish there was a little bit more humor than what yeah. was given. Yeah, I mean the humor we got was great, but I, I agree. Like because to to do a comedy horror is, I'm not I'm saying that it's a difficult task, but it's definitely a task to pull off and to do so um, well or successfully. Uh, but I think Dylan Reynolds did an excellent job oh, uh, directing definitely. and do you know doing all this shit for this movie. I mean, I mean he wrote it as well. So like you know, hats off to Dylan for you know a great script and mm -hmm. a great cast and a great movie. I I you know. 
I look at this movie and, you know, people would look at like the title or they would look at the, the cover art of it and they would, you know, probably shit on it. But dude, like the film quality was great. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a point that I will make now before we get into the next film. Always step out of the comfort zone that you have with any kind of media and look from the inside in, basically. Because what you're going to do is you're going to start experiencing, you know, films, movies, or films, music, TV, whatever, that is not your cup of tea, but you start to relate to them in certain aspects that you you never would have thought that you would have with, you know, what movies you already are accustomed to. Because with a lot of these, like, B-movies and stuff like that, sure, outside looking in, they can be cringy, film-wise, you know, dialogue, story plot, whatever, and I get it. You know, we're not going to have the perfect movie half the time, but they're still enjoyable to an extent if you really give it that chance, like you told me earlier. Like, people need to give it an opportunity to impress them in some form or fashion. So that's, that's just my take on it. Like, give it a chance. You'll be surprised towards the end of it how you can relate to it in some way. Absolutely. And, <clears throat> like, because people out there and a lot of young filmmakers and, and hell, some, you know, seasoned veterans, you know, they may not have access to the budget or the material to do what they really have in mind to do. And I think the only way to get those people there is to support the projects that they do work on and give them a chance, just like you were saying. Give them an honest shake mm-hmm. because... Um, so you can find good gems. I mean, fuck, we didn't fucking start out like this. Like, we started out, like, with a goddamn phone on the table using an iPhone mic. But, I mean, like, you know, like, you get to where you need to go. So, shit, you know? I mean, look at Samurai Cop. That was, like, my introduction to B-movies, basically. Like, I've yeah. seen a sparing amount of them here and there, but that was my introduction, and I gave it a chance knowing what I know about the concept, I was not going to be that open about it until I actually sat down and, you know, gave it a chance. Yeah, absolutely, dude. And, like, the thing that I I liked the most about 420 Massacre was the fact that it's got that shoe... Not just, like, shoestring budget, but it's it's definitely got, like, that... um, It's an an indie film, but to watch it, it looked so professional... Like, obviously professionally done, but it looked just so, like... This should have had a theatrical release or at least a small like you know like little minor theaters basically yeah something like that yeah but definitely look we're gonna jump into the next film because i mean like that's that's pretty much what i've got for this one if you unless you got any more no, uh i'm good like out there we're gonna have a link in the show notes below to uh stream this on the amazon prime page definitely give this movie a shot. I fucking loved it, and I would definitely recommend it to anybody that likes outside-the-box thinking is in terms of indie, horror, comedy. Give this movie a fair shot. Like Cody was saying, don't judge a fucking book by its cover. Like, Go give this movie your money and give it a chance. Like, Dylan, fucking hats off to you for making a great movie, dude. We fucking loved it. Oh, agreed. Uh, so we move on from that one to our homeboy, Gino McGahee, from... Cinema Epoch with Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre. And just the title alone has piqued my curiosity. The, it's a mouthful. But, it is. Well, the original title was Family Secret. And it was, uh, I think, a little bit longer than this one. Like the, the runtime. And I know um, Gino had told me that uh, he kind of recut you know, he recut the length of it with a new title to kind of breathe some life into it. Um, he said like the title wasn't really moving and, um, you know, things like that. So, which I would kind of disagree. I think family secret is actually more of that curiosity grasping kind of concept. Like, what is this about? Like, what kind of secret is this? Because it could be just a psychological thing or it could be a, like a traumatic thing, you know? Yeah. And, and this, this may have been, um, to get it out there more. This is like, oh, because like Family Secret, okay, that could be the title of really anything. But if you put a movie out called Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre, it's like, oh, what the fuck? That's a long title. That's a mouthful. Holy shit. Because that's what drew me in. I was like, holy shit. When he told me like what the name of it was, I was like, I got to go fucking watch this now. Why not? <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> so um, let, let's get into this. Uh, I will... Um, and I'll in give this you, corner. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you a rundown of everything that Gino had said about this, you know, and then we'll go into it. Mm-hmm. So 
he had said that this movie is kind of based on his family. Um, that his family had said that they had some family secret or whatever. And he was uh, kind of joking about it. Um, he wrote this film as a joke that he was uh, speaking with his sister after his grandmother's funeral. He joked about having a whodunit slasher based on all their relatives. And once he got a little bit of a budget, decided to make it. Now, this movie was done over the course of six months on every weekend, like tirelessly shooting every fucking weekend for six months on a $15,000 budget. So, again, we say, don't let that throw you off. Give it a shot. We're going to get into it and fucking go. So, you warned me a couple weeks ago that I may not be as, um, what's the word? Enthused about it, pretty much. As receiving? Yeah, something about like it. That. Yeah. And I thought about it. I processed it. And you, you were kind of right. But at the same time, I did receive it a little better than I thought I would. Um, it basically introduces the character Gino as a, as a reporter, a yeah, journalist. He works for a newspaper, yeah. Right. So he's a, he's working on a job. His wife's you know talking to him about everything, and he gets a call from a relative or somebody stating that his grandmother just passed away. Now this is where it kind of like makes me chuckle at times. Was his wife's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he's like, don't be sorry. I hated that bitch. She's like, grandmother was a wicked woman. Yeah, and I thought that was so funny. She used to beat the shit out of us. I thought that was so funny because, you know, he was giving us like, you know, real good like dialogue. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, thanks, bye. What was that? Oh, my grandmother just died. (laughs) It was just like a punch to the like, what? (laughs) Right, right. Well, it... (laughs) But, and that's the thing that I liked about this movie that we'll get into more and as we go. Like you, you've got the you've got the stuff that was like serious dialogue, and then and then there was some dialogue done by some of the characters that you're just like, holy shit, that's funny. Like, you know, like the just the the things they would say to each other. Mm-hmm. Like, the, um, oh my god, what's the um, what was the big dude's name? Gary. Gary. <laughs> He's like, blow it out your ass, you fat bitch. Like, just that dude fucking MVP of this fucking movie. That guy was goddamn hilarious. Hey, girl, nice tits. <laughs> Sweet tits? Sweet tits. God damn it. But, uh, no, g- getting into this movie, like, um, Gino's character, or the character of Gino, uh, winds up having a nightmare about his, his deceased grandmother. Nana. Nana. So he wakes up. Uh, his wife's like, you know what's wrong? He's like, oh, I had a nightmare, blah, blah, blah. And he keep this, this keeps happening. He keeps having like recurring nightmare. And, um, what happens is they, uh, they all converge into a family, uh, you know, f- they had the funeral for the grandmother and they're all at the, the viewing or the wake or the after party, as he says, which that was the, the, the joke. He was like, well, I guess I'll talk to him all at the fucking funeral after party. And the wife's like, Funeral after party. He's like, yeah, I guess it's a party for whenever somebody dies or some shit like that. And I was like, oh my god, this is fucking great. I'll just go there, you know, talk to him a little while, eat something, and just book it. Yeah, he's like, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to these assholes and you know, shit like that. So, um, we we get introduced to like several different people in this family where he's like, oh, this is my cousin, this is like a, a sister, uh, a brother in law, you know, that whole nine, and. What was homeboy with the uh, domestic violence? Fuck, I can't remember his name. But anyway, they were they panned to this one part of the family. This guy was sitting at the dinner table and he was reviewing mail, credit card statement. Yeah, yeah. And she walks in and starts, you know, bitching about something. He's like, "Do you know how much fucking money you spend on everything?" Yeah, he's like, "You." He's like, "You spent two thousand dollars on the card. You're gonna take this house right out from under us." And she, and he's like, "I'm cutting you off." And she's like, well, you need to get a better job. And he's like, no, you need to get a job. And man, she like mouthed off to him. He ran up to her and just... I mean, he fucking... Humorlessly bitch slapped this cunt to the wall and just delivered this like very painful like well, you will listen to me kind of attitude. Well because at the fir- at first she just looked at him and she was just like, you know, you need to make more money. Like you are not cutting me off. I'm going to keep spending no matter what blah blah blah. Basically just run this dude into the dirt and then he's and she's like um you know, d- I'm not going to stop. Do you understand? I said, "Do you understand?" And so that's when he gets up and you just hear <laughs> like I mean, he fucking like Now dude. We don't condone domestic no. abuse at all, 
but it's just the delivery was kind of like, you know, funny. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of chuckled when that happened, and not for that reason, but like you said, the fucking the way the the, the way the shot picked up and the way it happened so quickly. I was just like, because the first time I watched that, I went, "Oh shit!" Yeah. And then he just, like you said, pans up against the wall, and he's just like, "No, blah blah blah." You know, you, you know, you understand me. I do said, you do understand you? me? Yeah, and she's like, yes, yes, I do, blah, blah, blah. So, like, that whole introduction happens, and you're just like, oh, fuck. I, I think I know what kind of ride we're in for. Yeehaw. So, they get to the funeral, and Gino is kind of walking around, you know, slowly, like, re-meeting all these people. And then uh, there is one point where um, Gary, that character, um, was sitting down. This is, I think this is, like, actually before the funeral. He was sitting down on the couch, and... um his wife is all like, oh, um, when are you guys going to go out? Because uh, he does like contract work or whatever. And he's like, we only go out when we're called out for a job. She's like, well, you know, you can come work at the donut shop. You know, they need a cashier. And he's eating a mouthful of donuts. And he's like, work at a donut shop? Never. No way. Just mouthful. And I'm dying because there's like this big motherfucker with powdered donut all over him. Mm-hmm. Daughter walks in. And to make a long story short, basically, like, berates her for meeting her boyfriend on the internet and, <sighs> Jesus Christ, fucking straight up tells her uh, that if the dude is black, he's going to fucking kill the both of them, which this movie actually does not hold back from, like, the sexism, the racism, and, like, all that other shit. And it's not done in, like, an over-the-top manner, but it's done in such a way where you're just like, holy shit. Yeah. You know, it shows you that very real side of, like... Family you know, disturbing. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It shows you that real side of, like, the dark portions of, you know, family. I think, you know, everybody out there can relate that they've got a family member or two that are like this, and you're mm-hmm. just embarrassed of it, so you know but anyway like i'm saying that to get to this point they're the fucking viewing and in comes old girl with her dude and he just comes out and he's like i fucking told you blah 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 and he's like you bringing in this darky and you're just like oh jesus christ and this motherfucker's like what i'm gonna beat your fat ass and i'm just like oh my god please punch the fuck out of him like i wanted to see that so bad and like you said, we were just not expecting this, and now we're just like, here we go. Yeah. Here we fucking go. Here we fucking go. So they fucking leave. Um, the daughter and the boyfriend, they fucking leave, and they walk outside. And uh, I believe this is where we get to the first two kills of the movie. Here comes Nana. Here comes Nana with a motherfucking meat cleaver. Which, by the way, the audio behind the cleaving, grade A gold. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's that's literally all you hear every time she slams the people, slams the people with the cleaver. Got the fucking job done though. Yeah, dude, killed homeboy because he was like, I gotta take a piss or whatever. So then whole girl comes walking around and she's like, "Hello, blah blah blah," like looking for him. Then she sees him on the ground. Tyrone. Yeah, that's it. I couldn't remember his name. She's like Tyrone. Looks on the fucking ground and she's like the fuck and then she looks up and she's like ah and you don't hear anything happen you just see like a fucking a chopped off hand hit the ground and you're just like oh damn gotta hand it to you that's right gotta gotta hand it right to you Mm. dude you know what though you have to admit now all her fucking gloves are two for one I'm just saying (laughs) Anyway, yeah. So (laughs) we get five finger discount. That's it. That's exactly right. (laughs) Five finger death count. So we we get to um, Gino's job where he is in a cubicle working for the newspaper and all this other shit. And can we point out that the IT department in this place is just shit? Nothing is on. Nothing is being used. Not a computer monitor. Not a printer. Nothing. Nothing. It's just doing work on a black screen. That's right. This is how we get our job done. Or is it a privacy screen? We just can't see shit because it's from the angle. That's right. Ooh, we didn't think about that. Just saying. But no, it 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 kind of added to the like you know thing where I was like, oh my god, this is great. I mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's he I, is this is this the portion where the uh. 
oh, the female assistant was flirting with him and shit. She's flirting with him all throughout the fucking any time that they're in the office. And then yeah. you got the other guy. Um, uh, was it G- Giebner? Yeah, Giebner, the guy yeah. that looked he like. I don't know if this was like intentionally done or not, but I'll go ahead and just you know assume maybe it was like. He didn't have the exact color scheme, but he definitely had the fucking fedora and striped sweater. And I was like, hey, it's that Freddy Krueger motherfucker. And homeboy had a freaking ponytail. Jesus. Looked yeah. like he swept his backside with it almost. Because every time you see him talking to somebody, it was just like, ponytail. Ponytail! I mean, that's literally just like fedora, ponytail. Satanic ponytail masker. Fedora ponytail masker. Fedora. Fedora the Explorer. My lady. My lady. So strangle you, right? So this guy was actually an entertaining character too, because he is actually at constant odds with Gino over who's going to be like the higher up, you know, story writer or like you know editor or whatever, like reporter. So the only way they'll do that is they bring pictures of Spider Man. Spider Man, bitch. Parker, bring a picture of Spider Man. Yeah, <laughs> and some cheese puffs. Shit. This is shit. More shit. More and more shit. Are you bring me shit? <laughs> right. Anyway. Parker, this is crap. Crap. So, um, Gino goes out because he gets a call to go investigate the, the murders that happened. And upon, you know, getting there, he realizes, holy shit, this is my cousin and her fucking boyfriend. What the hell? Who did this to them? That fucking police chief detective dude. Holy God. That motherfucker. Yes. Just, I don't even like. You just, you just get like the vibe from that motherfucker the whole time, really. Some kind of vibe. I mean, you get a lot of vibes from a lot of these characters. Yeah, that's honest. that's very true. But so that happens. Like he he brings him to the station because now considering that you know he knows the victims he's uh considered a prime suspect now obviously so they sit him down and they go over like oh where were you this that and the other and you know <laughs> you know they 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 spin the movie forward to where Gino is now kind of investigating these murders as they happen because there actually are quite a bit of them do um, we go to the bowling alley now I mean, if we was, I would say skip through like the, you know the meat of them. The, the, like what we're saying is that there's a lot of dialogue in this movie as well mm-hmm. that kind of sets up the exposition for what's happening. Really, what you know, Gino slowly deduces that it's his his Nana that is um, not dead, as she's you know been presumed to be that she she's not dead. And you know, he tells his wife, he's like, "Oh, you're gonna think I'm crazy, all this other shit like that." And then you know, throughout the movie, you kind of get these hints of like. Somebody knows what's up, but nobody's saying anything. Um, Giebner is like thinks it's Gino. Like he's bound and determined to prove that it's Gino, just so he can have his fucking job. Right. The uh, I guess this leads. Well, this sort of leads into the bowling alley because they go to visit his grandfather. Right. So the grandfather basically reveals that there is a family secret and all this. He does. He's kind of vague with it though. You know, like the grandpa's a little vague with the. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a family secret, so, I mean, you gotta have to be vague. Yeah, but he, he's like, you know, there is, he's like, everything that is black is white, and everything that is white is black. You don't, you know, trust what you see and all this other shit like that, so, you know, obviously. And, and at that moment, I looked at my skin, and I was like, holy shit, I'm black. Oh, fuck. I'm Luke Cage now, motherfucker. Hey, I ain't complaining about that. Same. Michael Coulter. Anybody want to come get some coffee? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so they they get to uh his house. Uh, Gino goes to his house and his wife is there. Um and they all of a sudden need him back at the police station. And again, more, you know, investigation. Yeah, so dialogue. Yeah. So what winds up happening is the uh FBI agent in charge or, or like whoever it is that's in charge of like spearheading this entire thing, like uh well, actually, I'm skipping a little bit ahead. Let's do the bowling alley thing. So, can we talk about Gary meeting homeboy? Are oh, you talking about at the bar? Yeah. Okay, so let's do that and then go to the bowling alley. Because I forgot that was at, that was at the bar. But I yeah, did too. That was very creepy, for one. 
Because this dude, I don't know what his purpose was in the entire movie, but he literally was sitting there trying to talk to Gary about, oh, you have $5? Like, it's like Gary Busey looking smile on his face. And he's like, I suck your dick. I suck your dick for $5. He's like, man, I ain't no gay. And he starts, you know, grabbing him and just very casually... Not even aggressively, just, just holds like, him. Just holds him and just kind of tugs him, and sh- tugs on his shirt a little bit. It's like, uh, uh, just weird, well, like, f- transition. Well, what makes me laugh, though, is he, he lets him go, and he starts to walk out, and then the two detectives come in, and then he just looks at him and almost, like, flips it around a place. About, he <laughs> he wanted to pay me $5 to suck his dick. <laughs> and at, at which point, I fucking died. I was like, oh, that was fucking genius. But, yeah, re, you know, fast forward to the bowling alley, so... Gary's there. They're all bowling and stuff like that, obviously. And you had pointed out something because he was about to bowl with like this tea tiny, like little, look like a little ski ball, almost. ski ball thing. And they're doing their thing with that. And then they transition to the, um, I think it's the ladies' room at one point where they had the two teenagers yeah. in there. Yeah, the two teen, these, these two teenagers are, are they're in they're in the uh the the women's restroom and uh, I think they're shit talking like, you know, uh some dude one of them is dating or like some dude that's into one of them and she's all like, "Yeah, um you know, like I'm not going to date a dude whose chest is bigger than mine, blah blah blah." And then they're trying to get in the bathroom and they turn around, and they knock on the stall. They're like, "What's going on in there? Did you it's fall like, in? Are you done? Are you done?" And then literally the fucking stall door opens. Yeah, literally. There's <laughs> Nana just fucking caves their fucking heads in. So we go out of there, and then this other teen kid boy is there with like two other ones, and he's like, "Oh, I don't know where they're at." And they're like, "And they're like, oh, just go knock on the door and check on them. If they're okay, they'll tell you. If not, just go in and check on them. It's not a big deal." So he fucking opens the fucking door. This I fucking love this one because it, it literally made me like laugh out loud because it was just so fucking like sudden and and, and it, just the way it happened. It's like hey hey hey, yeah. Stall door closes. Yeah, dude. Nana walks in and you hear cake just crack him over the fucking head with that cleaver and then the door shuts and you're just like holy shit that little fucking young kid just bit it so hard. Biffed it. Biffed it. So yeah, literally now everybody's panicking because there's a killer on the loose. Now. And they see it happening now. Mm-hmm. So Nana shows up and fucking John, or I'm not John, uh, Gary, Gary fucking roll. Oh my God. Him and that chick fucking run to that room. There's like, oh, not an exit. And they basically fucking like, as you said, they fucking cornholed themselves in that fucking room. Mm-hmm. And what did he say? Um, like she Because Nana comes in and slices the chick up. And then faces off with with fucking uh, Gary, and he just puts his fucking dukes up. He's like, "What? What do you say?" He's like, "Bring it on, Grandma," or some shit like Bring that. Bring it on, Granny, or something. Yeah, like that's- that. <laughs> come get it, Granny, or something. Come get it, God, Granny. Yeah. Damn it, dude. I was like, yes, but then unfortunately, he gets his ass handed to him, and we're just like, God damn it! There went like one of the best characters in this fucking movie, the most racist one. And that's not why that he's my like he's one of the best characters. I I think it's because this dude's delivery of every fucking line in the this perso- movie. The personality is just so spot on with him. Yeah, it's great. Like every like seriously, everything as simple as that one line was like, "Oh, blow it out your ass, you fat bitch." I died. And okay. didn't he call homeboy the uh, bowling out of skinhead? Cue ball. Cue ball. He's like. Hey, not a fucking hair on his head or something. He's like, he's, you know, bald, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, my God. But I thought he called him a skinhead at one point. He may have. And then he tried to, like, I fight, felt, fist fight him and shit, and he just threw him, like, either over the stools or over the counter or something. I felt personally attacked by the relatability of that content. You bitch. <sighs> so is he Gary Abusey? I think he is Gary Abusey. Oh, my God. Oh my god. You need therapy? Yes. Damn it. Damn it. So <laughs> Massacre at the bowling alley, no pun intended. So that happens. No pun intended. Right? And then he slices that okay, the, the 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 chick that was working behind the counter is outside already. And the Nana just comes and slices her right in the stomach. And this is where you pointed out. Okay. Sometimes I get confused with certain sound effects, especially from killing. How is it that sometimes 
you kill someone and they sound like they're dying in agony, but on some instances they sound like they're having a fucking orgasm. A good one at that. Like this chick up against the brick wall gets sliced in the stomach with the cleaver and all you hear is just like uh, 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 like just what the fuck is she doing? Like is she a masochist or something? I mean maybe. I mean jeez. Wow. <laughs> you guys she died. Slice and dice. Wow. Chop. And screw. <laughs> Satanic slap chop massacre. <laughs> What's homeboy's name from the infomercials? Um, Vince Offer. Vince Offer. <laughs> What's slap chop? Yes. Gino, get this guy and fucking do it, please. My do it God. Now. Slap Sham- chop. Shamwell. <laughs> Shamwell. So, <clears throat> anyway. That all happens, and uh, I guess we'll go ahead and kind of fast forward to where um, the the detective kind of pulls Gino aside and is like, oh, we got to go, and then basically informs him they're going to go because he's tracked down this fucking cult of people. Right. So they go to this cabin, arms him with a gun. He's got a sawed off, and they kind of walk around. And then you get the reveal of who Nana is as far as the killer. And it's the uh, abusive boyfriend from the beginning of the movie that I fucking did not see coming. Like, at all. But, here's the kicker. It's not just him. It's literally all the people. Yeah, like, literally. His wife. Yeah, his wife, his boss. His boss. Like, his entire family. And they're not trying to kill him or off him or anything they're trying to convince him to join their ritual that way he along with them can have everything they've ever wanted because apparently this this insane this same cult has everybody in their pocket the fbi police politicians literally everybody is in their fucking pocket so you know Gino's dream of being like a writer at a big time magazine would finally come true. His wife's trying to convince him and they and they bring in the police chief guy's like assistant to murder. And he's like, I'm sitting here with a fucking knife in my hand, you know, like we're better than this, all this other shit. He flat out just refuses. So like a couple of them try to kill him and he winds up getting away. And then he goes to try to turn this in to FBI. And then this is when you get the reveal that, like, the guy that he's talking to, like, he just spills all this information out to this guy. And then Mm -hmm. the dude puts his fucking hands together on the desk, and he says something like, you know, oh, tell me more about this, or whatever. And he's got the same ring. The skull ring. Yeah, everybody that's in this cult has the same skull ring. And that you cut to credits, you know? And, dude, look. I wish... I wish Gino had more uh more of a budget that he could have which obviously you work with what you got but like i wish somebody could have come along grabbed this movie up and been like dude we we will back you with like 300,000 mm-hmm. because the execution was good for what he had i loved the script for this movie i really enjoyed the idea of it cuz look man it's rare that you find a movie where you don't expect the ending It's more of, I enjoy concepts that throw you so far off from what the actual reality is that you're just so dumbfounded when it does happen. In a good way, yeah. Yeah. So you get all this humor, all this like backlash and this like inner monologue with the family members and whatnot. But as the killing happens, you're like, oh, it could be... It's this, a whodunit. It's a whodunit, like a clue, basically. So now yeah. it's like, okay, I suspected this person right here, and he looks suspicious. Mm, we should look at him more closely. But then all of a sudden, it's like every motherfucker. It's like, how do you how do you see that shit coming? You don't. I because I, I was just gonna pin it down to one person, which is your normal instinct. It's always gotta be that one person behind the mask of Nana. Like, who is Nana at yeah. this point? But you come to realize everybody's Nana. Yeah. So. And, dude, like, seriously, again, just like Dylan in the first movie, like, fucking straight up hats off to Gino for making a good movie, in my opinion, because um, 
there's literally something in this for everybody. Like if if you've you know like we've said before, if you've got like that same kind of home life, or if you've ever known anybody that's kind of like this, you can relate to the you know you can relate to these characters. Um, I really enjoyed the people that played these characters. I really enjoyed the script. I enjoyed um, I enjoyed everything about it really. Um, but you know, give it a shot. We we like sitting through and watching these things, but. Like I said before, man, if Gino had like an, enough umph, like of uh, support, this this movie probably could have. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad by any means of the imagination, but it probably could have been like more, you know, more close to what he really, really wanted to accomplish. Close to his dream, his idea behind it. Yeah, yeah. And Gino has like several movies that he's done, you know. So I mean, I'm trying to get you know check the rest of those out as well. But like this was this was my first watching of any of his movies was this one. And this is actually his favorite. Now he was telling me that this is this is his favorite movie because he had actually uh, given up on directing for like six six years, years yeah. Mm-hmm. And that um, this was at the time he thought this was just going to be his very last two raw, and he wound up getting the directing bug again, which thankfully because you know he he does have talent. I will give him that. Oh, absolutely, he does, man. He's a great a great writer, and he's got a great vision. Mm-hmm. You know, because you know he's filming the shit himself, too. So, I mean, like, camera angles and all that. I, I love it. I absolutely adore this fucking movie. So, what I would like to have seen was, like, a filter. Like, a specific type of, like, maybe a, a grain filter or um, a different tone of color, maybe, to the cinematography. And that would have maybe enhanced it a little bit more for me. But, like you said, overall, it was a good quality film for what he had available to him. So Absolutely. I give you know, I give him props for that. Hell yeah. And I know he's got an uh I know he's got a few other films on the Amazon Prime page through Cinema Epoch that people can check out alongside this one, which we'll mm-hmm. pr- we'll put them in the show notes below. So go check that shit out. Do it. Do it now. So uh that's uh let's see. I'm trying to make sure I have, you know, everything mentioned down All there. your oh. ducks. All my ducks in a row from Toronto. Some say the ducks went to Canada. Others say Toronto. But it could be that there is just no room in this modern world for an old man and his duck ducks. <laughs> Jesus Chrysler. Aren't you glad I introduced you to that? I really am. I really fucking am. Okay, you don't guys. sound it. <laughs> no, I am. It's just it's <laughs> it's it's early in the morning, late at night, early in the morning. Something. Something. No, look. Okay. Four Twenty Massacre, directed by Dylan Reynolds. In the show notes below, go rent it on Amazon Prime. Give it your money. Check it the fuck out. Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre by Gino McGahey. It's on Cinema Epoch's Amazon Prime stream. It's for free. You can stream it with your Amazon Prime account. Fucking go check it out and check the rest of Gino's movies out as well. Mm -hmm. Big time. Uh, I'm really glad that we got these to do first. I enjoyed both of these movies thoroughly. Once again, highly recommend everybody out there checking them out. Go share them with your friends. Also, big fucking shout out to um, uh, there's a video chain uh, in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. I think it's called Family Video. Okay. They actually carry for anybody up in in the Midwest that listens to us. Uh, Family Video is a chain in the Midwest that actually has physical copies a 420 masker to rent. Like one of the last remaining video rental chains. And that is legit. Like no doubt. I miss that. Mhm. I fucking miss the feeling of walking into a store, picking something up physically and renting it. That's just nostalgia all over. It really is. So, go do that out there. Support that movie and support Gino's film in any way that you can. Tell a friend about it. Get your friends watching it, you know, go you know, get you an Amazon Prime account and just enjoy the fuck out of these movies. We're going to be doing, you know, I, I want to do more of this series of the of the Cult Cinema Showdown series. So as it stacks, you know, together, like how would you, um, how would you recommend these? Like as far as like a scale of like, okay, if somebody's looking for a specific type of movie, like 
do you give them like if you if like oh I want Andy Har give them Satanic Meat Cleaver Massacre or 420 Massacre if somebody's looking for like a comedy do you give them you know what I'm saying like what do you, how do you, how do you definitely indie horror go for Satanic I will recommend that for sure and then like you said comedic horror to a degree I would do 420 Massacre yeah so um and as far as I as far as I'm concerned uh once again definitely definitely recommend these films uh, mm-hmm. I loved both of them so with that being said uh, we'll do more of these and we'll announce them in the weeks to come as far as like which films we're going to be doing. So uh, I think <laughs> if I'm not mistaking, I'm trying to look at my, uh, trying to look at my schedule on these shows in the next couple of weeks. I don't know specifically when, but in the next couple of weeks we will be having uh, the return of our flop 10 list. Yeah. yeah. And, that's definitely going to be a fun one. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> usually what we do in that one is we take 20 uh, of something, depending on what we you know deem it, and we put the 20 into an elimination-style battle royal bracket. And then we label it down to 10, and then we rank them from worst to the very fucking worst. And that's the concept of the flop is it could be the worst music videos, could be the worst songs, worst games, movies, something that fits this floppity flop. That's right. Big floppy donkey dick. (laughs) (sighs) All right. So everybody out there, you know the fucking drill. If you want to follow the super media bros on social media. Here we go. Here we go. Facebook.com slash Supermedia Bros. Mm-hmm. Twitter.com slash Supermedia underscore bros. Mm-hmm. Instagram.com slash Supermedia Bros podcast. Uh. Come look at our stupid pictures. God damn it. Do we have to remind y'all every episode? Just we shouldn't. No. Follow us, please. Come look at our stupid pictures. We're, we're literally retarded. In these pictures. Yeah, I mean, just go do it. And then on top of that, like, go like our Facebook page. You know, those are going to be in the show notes below as well. You don't have to fucking go type this shit in. We've made it easy for you. Just scroll up, look in the show notes, direct links to any of those sites. Also, Q&A, y'all need to ask more questions. Yeah, I think we've only got about three in the bank right now. So we need some support. I don't care if it's you or somebody you know that wants to ask us personally anything please cue us so we can a you that's right you can you can slide into our dms on our facebook or instagram or you can email us at supermedia bros podcast at gmail.com go and do it for us do it your favorite peoples and not only will we feature your question we will feature you like if you give us your name your oh. user handle any of that we, we will shout you out on the podcast isn't that awesome yeah, and also, if you submit a question, send us your information, and we will give you a free sticker for sending us a question to be answered on the show. Of your choosing. That's right. You can do the original or the die cut. Yes, sir. Whichever one you like. Yes. And who doesn't like free shit? I love free shit. I do, too, especially when it has our brand on it. That's right. God damn. That badge is fucking sexy. Mm, just like us that's right yeah and with that we are gonna get the fuck out of here and get some sleep get some motherfucking sleep (laughs) (laughs) we're definitely tired yeah that was cold cinema showdown of cannabis and cleavers until next time i've been midnight agent raw and i've been okami shades on we're all 